Welcome, everybody, uh, to our weekly Cyber Policy Center workshop. Uh, we are thrilled to have one of our own uh, presenting today, uh, Rihanna Pfeffer-Korn of the Stanford In Internet Observatory, where she is a research scholar, but has been uh, at Stanford in many different capacities uh, uh, since I've been here over the last decade. Um, and she will be uh, addressing you know, a topic that not only has SIO been at the forefront of, but uh, I think if you've come to some of our other seminars, uh, we always bring this issue up uh, when we talk about the advent of AI, particularly open source AI, and um, uh, how it's uh, having an effect on the ability of, of people uh, to, to generate this kind of imagery. So Rihanna is uh, a real lawyer uh, who did, works on real cases, uh, as well as uh, being a researcher who, who works in these, I would say, um, uh, you know, ivy-covered halls here, but it's more like Adobe here at Stanford. Uh, uh, and so uh, it's worked on, on issues of surveillance, First Amendment issues, privacy, and so we're thrilled to have her here. Uh, as with all of our uh, sessions, she'll talk for about a half an hour. Those of you who are on Zoom, uh, please put in your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, and those uh, who are here in the, in the room, uh, raise your hand afterwards. Uh, please join me in welcoming Brianna Pfefferkorn. Right. Thank you, Nate. Thank you for having me here today. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a fairly short summary of a paper that I put out earlier this month for Lawfare for their digital social contract paper series. I'll have a link up to it at the end. Happy to share it via email as well. Um, the TLDR for today is that generative AI now enables the creation of highly realistic looking child sex abuse material, or CSAM for short formerly known as child pornography, although that is now a disfavored term because pornography implies consent and that's not present when we're talking about uh, the abuse of children. Um, as the technology for making images with generative AI gets uh, better and better, there will be increasing verisimilitude to the output of those models. And that's going to make it harder and harder to tell real hands-on abuse depictions from material that has been generated through AI, what I refer to as CG or computer generated CSAM in the paper. And while it might potentially seem a little uh, counterintuitive, not all computer-generated CSAM can constitutionally be prohibited. Some of it is protected speech, although a lot of it actually is covered by existing federal criminal law. Nevertheless, having these evidentiary questions of telling real apart from fake and constitutional issues of what is protected speech versus what is unprotected speech means that prosecutors, who historically have been faced mostly with obviously real content are going to have to adapt their strategies to this brave new world. Um, a further complexifying factor in how to handle this emerging policy issue is that under existing federal law, online platforms are required to report CSAM on their services when they find out about it. And as computer-generated CSAM becomes more prevalent, they are going to start reporting that material too alongside the photographic actual depictions of abuse. And perhaps as usual with the sorts of topics that we discussed during this, uh, this lunchtime series, these are very complex issues that don't have any easy answers. So what's happening out there in the world? Well, CGC SAM is currently a very small portion of the overall iceberg of abuse material that exists online, but it's a problem that's going to continue to grow because of how easy it is for people to generate large volumes of new imagery uh, relatively quickly. Those images are often trained on data sets that go into the ML models that are used for image generation that have been trained on and include, <coughs> excuse me, actual photographic abuse images of the sexual abuse of children. And the reason for that is while we may be familiar with using something like ChatGPT or OpenAI, where it is a third party hosted site into which you are plugging prompts, uh, there are AI models that you can download and train locally on your own machine. A good example of this is Stable Diffusion 1.5 which had been, in some cases, released without having adequate guardrails against abusive uses of those models before they were released into the wild. And then, because it is now possible to train up a model locally on consumer-grade hardware 
rather than needing uh, lab grade conditions at NVIDIA or something, you can now use your own graphics card, your own local machine to train up an AI model. And so even after the fact, making an update to a model to add more mitigations against abusive uses and even having third party sites that do invest a lot of work into trying to combat the abusive uses of their third party hosted models, those things can't stop all computer generated CSAM from happening because people can generate this on their own local machines using older versions of models that they then can tweak. And so what we anticipate is going to happen is that uh, a lot of this sort of computer generated material is going to start flooding into the pipeline by which online platforms currently report CSAM on their services, which already receives well over 30 million reports every year of images that are found on large and small sites alike. And so as those continue to proliferate, that's going to pose a problem for telling how to handle those things. And then already, something that has been coming up in news stories, it seems like basically every day, we're seeing real life instances of pornographic, non-consensual deep fakes of children, mostly teenage girls, that are being made and circulated online, typically by their own peers. Um, so this is far from just being about the generation of images of people who don't actually exist, who are children that have no actual real life counterpart, but rather the creation of imagery that victimizes existing people in the real world. So what does the Constitution have to say about this? I mentioned that some of this material actually is constitutionally protected. Um, we have probably the most permissive free speech regime of any country on earth. And so there are very few categories of speech that are categorically unprotected by the First Amendment's uh, protections for freedom of speech. Two of those categories are obscene material and CSAM, child pornography, to use the language that's still on the books. Obscenity is a category of material that historically has been prohibited because it is considered to be extremely low value speech or no value speech that posed a threat to uh, the interest in maintaining order and morality. It sounds a little bit antiquated perhaps to us now. Um, the test for the last half century for whether material is legally obscene is the Miller test, which has three parts. It's whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the challenge work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest uh, whether the work describes or depicts in a patently offensive way sexual conduct as defined by uh, state law, and whether, taken as a whole, the work lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. If all three of those prongs of the three-prong Miller test are met, the material is legally obscene, and the government can engage in content-based regulation of that material without running afoul of the First Amendment. Separately, uh, the First Amendment also does not cover CSAM. And that is for a distinct rationale, as distinguished from the rationale for preventing obscenity. Instead, it is because the speech in question, the image, the video, is indivisible from the underlying criminal conduct, which is the abuse of children that harms them in a multitude of ways, physically, emotionally, et cetera. And while it may be a little counterintuitive, this is not the same rationale as obscenity. When the Supreme Court in 1982, in a, court, a case called New York versus Ferber, held that uh, what the court called child pornography is categorically unprotected by the First Amendment, the court said this is not uh, adequately covered by obscenity doctrine because it is irrelevant to the child who is being harmed that the, a particular piece of imagery might have some serious artistic value to it um, that has no bearing on the fact that this is doing harm to children and society has an overwhelmingly compelling interest in protecting children from harm. So obscenity doctrine and the prohibition against CSAM are two separate uh, categories of unprotected speech. However, 20 years ago in a case called Ashcroft v. Free Speech Coalition, the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment does protect what the court called virtual CSAM, uh, so long as it is not obscene, where something has been computer generated, there's no actual child involved in the production of that imagery, and therefore because there's no child who's actually being harmed, the rationale that the court had elucidated in New York v. Ferber for why child pornography is unprotected uh, speech does not apply. And therefore, so long as there isn't a real child involved in the production of an image, if it is virtual, that is protected speech. And so that has been a series of landmark decisions that shape how we need to be thinking about this new challenge of AI-generated material. Now, I'll mention, however, that there's probably uh, several laws on the books already that cover 
uh, a fair amount of the material that we might be, be facing. So one of those is uh, Section 1466A of Title 18 of the United States Code. The United States Code is where all the federal laws live. Title 18 is where most of the federal criminal laws live. Section 1466A is a child obscenity statute. It bans sexually explicit visual depictions of children uh, that are obscene. Separately, Section 2252A is a uh, ban on possession, receipt, transmission, et cetera, of child pornography. Again, still the language on the books, uh, which is defined in three ways. One is imagery that has been produced using real children. Another is computer-generated imagery that is virtually indistinguishable from an image of a real child or what is commonly referred to as morphed images, although that's not the phrase used in the statute, which is images of an actual identifiable child that has been altered to look like that identifiable child is engaging in sexually explicit conduct. Um, it is a defense to a claim under 2252A, but not 1466A, that there was no actual child involved in the production of the depiction. 1466A, because it is an obscenity statute, is justified by reference to making obscenity unprotected speech, and therefore there's no need for the child depicted actually to exist. In fact, it is expressly an element, uh, or expressly a, a provision of 1466A that says it's not required that any actual child have been harmed uh, in, in, in order to violate this statute. Uh, for 2252A, it is a defense to liability under that statute if you can show either that everybody depicted in a particular image or video was an adult at the time that the image was produced, or if it is virtual, meaning there is no actual child who is in it. It is computer generated an image, for example. Um, it is probably the case that the second portion of the three-part definition under federal law of what constitutes child pornography is probably unconstitutional. And the reason for that is, going back to the Ashcroft v. Free Speech Coalition case from 2002, in that case, the court had struck down the prior version of this, part, this prong of the definition of CSAM, where the Congress had previously banned uh, material that appears to be of a real child who's being uh, abused. And the court said, well, that is virtual material. You cannot ban a computer-generated image that appears to be of a child where there is no actual child involved in it. Congress's response was to go back to the drawing board the year after that Supreme Court case and amend that definition that had been struck down by the court to say, OK, we're going to ban computer-generated imagery that is virtually indistinguishable from uh, material involving a real child. And it's hard to see very much daylight between something that appears to be of a child and something that is virtually indistinguishable from an image of a child. Nevertheless, there hasn't been an actual constitutional challenge to this language um, in the 20 years since that language has been on the books under this amended definition. Um, and the reason for that, I'm not exactly sure, but if I were to speculate, it's probably that up until the advent of generative AI, you could generally tell that something was real or that something was computer generated or a cartoon or whatever. So there wasn't necessarily material that was truly virtually indistinguishable from an actual abuse image. It's only now that we may be crossing that Rubicon with the advent of generative AI. So the question then arises, now that we do have AI generated material that may be highly photorealistic, can we punish this new uh, this new problem under these existing laws on the books, or can we write new laws to prohibit it if not using these ones? And the lawyerly answer, as usual, is it depends. Um, I think it helps to construct a taxonomy of different types of CSAM in order to navigate these questions of constitutional coverage or not. Um, so these are categories that I name in the paper. The first is what I call photographic CSAM, which is where we're talking about imagery that is of an actual real child actually being abused. Um, it is Consider it suboptimal to refer to this as real or true CSAM because that might imply that there's no real harm to morphing an image of a child, even though that child isn't being abused. So photographic CSAM has a lot more syllables, though, than saying real or true. Um, so I may use those interchangeably. If something is photographic, actual picture of an actual child being abused, it does not matter if it is obscene or not. Because as mentioned, uh, actual child pornography of a real child is unprotected, whether it's obscene or not, because there are two distinct rationales under First Amendment doctrine for prohibiting that speech. However, a lot of CSAM will also be obscene. It will meet the three-part Miller test for obscenity. And in that case, it doesn't matter whether a real child is depicted in that image or not. Because obscenity doesn't require harm to an actual child, uh, it is possible to prohibit obscene CSAM on the basis of it being obscenity rather than on the basis of involving abuse of a child. Um, 
Separately, now that we have generative AI, we have imagery that was produced using a training data set that includes photographic imagery, what I call abuse trained CGC SAM in the paper. So this is where there's photographic CSAM in the training data that was used uh, for the ML model that outputs the image in question. And in this case, it doesn't necessarily matter that the output is or is not indistinguishable from uh, an actual uh, image of a real child. Um, here, the key factor is ultimately this image was produced using uh, imagery involving real children. Some CGC SAM is going to be photorealistic, and this seems like it would pretty f re readily fulfill the prong of the definition of CSAM under federal law as an image that is computer generated that is indistinguishable from photographic imagery. And there, it might not necessarily matter if the training data actually included photographic CSAM. You can imagine an ML model that has sexually explicit adult, legal adult pornography in it, and non-sexual imagery of children in it that can then be trained up to produce a sexual image of a child without having photographic CSAM itself in the training data. And then finally, what I call morphed image CG CSAM, which is where you take a non-sexual image of a real identifiable child who really exists in the world, and you morph it using generative AI into uh, a sexually explicit image of that child. And there again, it doesn't matter if there's actual photographic CSAM in the training data. Uh, the, the yardstick we're using there is, is the output of that ML model an image of an identifiable child? And there it also doesn't necessarily matter, I don't think, if it is photorealistic in terms of being indistinguishable from uh, an actual abuse image or not. The key there is can we identify that it's this child in this picture? And so once we have this taxonomy of different types of CGC SAM, we can then analyze it under the Supreme Court cases that I mentioned earlier. The Miller case, which provides the three-part test for obscenity. The Ferber case, which says that there is no First Amendment protection categorically for CSAM involving abuse of real children. And the Free Speech Coalition case, which says that virtual CSAM is First Amendment protected, as long as it's not obscene. And then we can determine which types of CGC SAM can constitutionally be prohibited under the law and on what basis. And so I have this flow chart that appears in the paper that we can run through. The first question is, OK, if we are considering a particular piece of ML generated uh, imagery, is it obscene? If the answer is yes, if it meets that three part test for obscenity, well, then we can prohibit it under Miller uh, without needing to show is there abuse material in the training data? Does this is there a real identifiable child in the output? You can prohibit it um, under the existing law that already covers child obscenity, section 1466A. Um, the next question is, does this depict an actual identifiable minor? And if the answer is yes, that constitutes a morphed image, which is already prohibited under 2252A, the morphed images prong of the definition of child pornography. And there I think the argument is that this is also prohibited material because the rationale that in the discussion that the Supreme Court has, has been making in its series of cases involving CSAM is that it is constitutional to prohibit every step along the way of uh, trying to stamp out the market for this kind of material. Uh, anything that involves the abuse of a child, whether that's production, whether that's the resale of material. When we're talking about uh, training up a data set to have a model that produces imagery on the output that involves uh, actual images of abuse, it is uh, commonly accepted uh, in the legal arguments against this that any reuse of material is a re-victimization of the child who's depicted in that imagery. And so training up a, a model on actual abuse imagery is another means of reusing and repurposing those existing abuse images. And therefore, because that re-harms the existing victims uh, in, in those images, um, you can then uh, still prohibit it. Um, when it comes to identifiable minors, it's actually interesting that the Supreme Court hasn't directly addressed uh, the morphed images prong of, uh, uh, of the definition of child pornography in any actual cases. So far, it's been the matter for the courts of appeals. Um, so when the Free Speech Coalition decision came down, that provided a lot of ammunition for defendants in other cases then to try and challenge their prosecutions on the basis of saying, if this is a virtual piece of material, then it cannot constitutionally be prohibited. And so, um, when the identifiable minor cases have come up under the morphed images prong in front of the appeals courts, they have nevertheless said, no, Free Speech Coalition doesn't cover this because um, it is still doing harm to the child who's depicted in that picture. 
And the courts there have said it may not be equivalent to the same sort of harm that happens from hands-on abuse of children um, who are actually being abused to produce material, but nevertheless, being depicted in an image that you were not actually involved in the generation of has reputational harms, has privacy harms, has emotional harms for the child who is depicted and therefore uh, can be that can still be prohibited. So if we're looking at both the output of a model that depicts an identifiable minor or the input of a model that involves photographic CSAM, the harm to children rationale still has a lot of potency there, and I think you can still use existing law under Section 2252A based with the Ferber rationale of harm to children placing this kind of material outside of constitutional protection uh, to say that if either an image depicts an identifiable minor or it was trained on photographic abuse imagery, those things can still be prohibited. It's where the question becomes, if this image does not meet the legal test for obscenity, it does not depict an actual identifiable child who exists in the world, and there's no photographic material in the training data, that's where I think we have zeroed in on the core of material that is AI-generated CSAM that is protected speech under Free Speech Coalition because none of the rationales uh, in either Miller or in Ferber would apply. And so that demonstrates that we have these different categories and we have to think carefully about what particular category a given image falls into. We cannot treat the entire bulk of computer generated imagery as though it was all the same. And before moving on, I just want to emphasize AI generated CSAM that is a morphed image of an actual minor is already illegal under federal law. I've been reading a lot of news stories as I was working on this paper that covered real life instances of usually teenage girls usually being victimized by their own high school classmates who create this, these sorts of images using apps online, circulate them among chat groups among themselves. And over and over again, I read news stories that say either the Supreme Court says this kind of thing is protected speech or they say there's no law that currently exists that bans this. Both of those are wrong. Existing federal criminal law bans morphed images. It is not, it is technology agnostic as to what is used to do it. It is not virtual CSAM that constitutes protected speech, end of story. So I've categorized the different types of CSAM. We've got obscene CG CSAM, morphed image CG CSAM, abuse trained CG CSAM, and truly wholly virtual CG CSAM. That last one is constitutionally protected speech. The other three are either clearly not or probably are not uh, protected speech. But as a practical matter, it's going to be hard to tell in a lot of situations whether an image falls into that protected speech category or not. That isn't going to be so much of a concern for morphed images. If you can pinpoint the person in a morphed image, like in these cases of high school girls who can say, my classmates are making these images of me, well, then you don't have any problem saying this falls into the morphed image category. But how are you going to know if a particular AI-generated image was trained on photographic abuse imagery or not? If something has been floating around on the internet for a while, how are you going to tell the provenance of that particular uh, piece of material to know just in the first place, is this you know, a real child that we haven't been able to identify, or was there abuse imagery involved in the training data that was used to produce it? And so when we have these questions that are evidentiary fact questions, and we have how the differences in those facts play into the constitutional questions of whether this is con like constitutionally protected speech or not, uh, then these pose some tricky questions for prosecutors on how they should respond because it matters to them if they are potentially going to bring uh, a case that they will fail to uh, be able to obtain a conviction or they might risk having that virtually indistinguishable language in the law and the books be struck down just the way its predecessor language had been struck down by the Supreme Court in the Free Speech Coalition case. So there are a few different possible responses that I think prosecutors could undertake. One would be, rather than relying so heavily on the CSAM statute, section 2252A, they could move instead to using the child obscenity statute, section 1466A. When I was researching this paper, I found to my surprise that in the 20 years that the child obscenity statute has been on the books, it's almost never been used. It's been used fewer than 200 times in the last 20 years, and there are more than 50 times as many cases, federal court cases, citing 2252A as citing 1466A. Um, and the reason for that might be it is practically a strict liability offense to own the radioactive material that is actual photographic CSAM, whereas Proving obscenity to a jury requires going through that three-part Miller test, um, and therefore it may be more work for prosecutors um, it, as opposed to getting somebody to plead out to charges of possession of what is uh, unquestionably heretofore in the pre-generative AI phase, um, 
real photographic material. So there may be more work involved. Um, it's also possible that there's a category of CGC SAM that wouldn't qualify as legally obscene. I mentioned that a lot of the time, uh, something that is, constitutes a picture of the sexual abuse of a child is going to qualify as legally obscene under that three-part test. But the courts have been saying that there may be some uh, sliver there where there isn't a complete overlap. So for example, uh, an appeals court relatively recently speculated that a computer-generated image involving a uh, depiction of older-looking teenagers involved in consensual behavior, that might not meet the three-part test for obscenity because it might not be patently offensive as the Miller test requires. Um, so it may be the case that prosecutors would have to try and figure out, could I persuade a jury that this meets that three-part test? There's also sort of a downside potentially in relying on that three-part test because it uh, asks jurors to evaluate uh, work taken as a whole by reference to contemporary community standards, whether a work is patently offensive. Um, and that lets in the possibility for bringing in jurors' biases. Obscenity doctrine might sound a little bit quaint to us now, insofar as material that had been considered obscene um, as recently as you know, living memory um, in the 50s and 60s, in the 30s and 40s, seems totally unobjectionable to us now because the mores and tastes of societies change over time. However, we find ourselves now in an era of uh, renewed hatred and discrimination and prejudice and violence against queer and trans people who have often been maligned as child groomers merely for existing. Um, and obscenity doctrine uh, is a means of bringing that sort of bias back into jury's decisions. Um, a friend of mine, Kendra Albert at Harvard Law, wrote a paper last fall about obscenity doctrine where they pointed out that well into the 1990s, juries were determining material to be legally obscene because it depicted homosexual conduct where it might have been completely unobjectionable if it involved heterosexual conduct. And so I don't think it's going to be a win for society in the age of AI-generated CSAM if we have juries deciding whether somebody goes to prison or not based on whether an image involves trans bodies instead of cisgender bodies or homosexual conduct instead of heterosexual conduct. So that's a downside that I see to the potential shift to relying more on obscenity doctrine under the child obscenity law rather than going with the CSAM law that's on the books now. There is an alternative that I've talked to with some child safety folks about this, and they agree that this is probably something that will come up in a lot of cases, which is that if an investigation uh, kicks off the ability to seize with a search warrant the devices or contents of an online account of somebody who is suspected of owning something that might potentially be an AI-generated image, might potentially be constitutionally protected, a lot of the times child sex offenders tend to own vast troves of photographic actual abuse imagery. And so rather than trying to invest a lot of time into figuring out, is this an AI-generated image? Is this constitutionally protected? Prosecutors will have the ability to, in many cases, charge somebody for the photographic material that they possess, possibly in quite a large volume, rather than focusing on the AI-generated material. Not only does that avoid these potentially complex evidentiary questions of trying to figure out where an image came from or who's depicted in it, and these constitutional questions of whether this is constitutionally protected or not, focusing on charging somebody for the indis indisputably photographic actual real CSAM that they own, I think properly would focus limited prosecutorial resources on cases involving actual harm to real children who really exist. But nevertheless, I think Hopefully this is made clear. Prosecutors have a lot on their plate. They have a lot of cases, usually often beyond just child safety cases. They have murders, they have you know, missing person cases, et cetera. Triaging their caseloads, even within child safety, is hard enough as it is. And once you start adding CGC SAM onto the pile, it's going to make that job of triaging and figuring out what the, what the strategy ought to be and whether to prosecute and how is only going to be more difficult. Um, and part of this is made more difficult by the fact that we can expect a lot more of this material to be landing on investigators' plates uh, in the coming years because of existing federal law that requires online platforms to report uh, what is an apparent uh, violation of the child sex abuse and exploitation statutes that they learn of about on their services. So if they see something that is apparently CSAM, they are required by federal law to report that. And the way that those reports are routed is that they go to something called the Cyber Tip Line, which is run by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMIC for short. NICMIC then acts as a clearinghouse that figures out which law enforcement agency uh, should a particular uh, report go to. Um, platforms face criminal charges and potentially hefty fines if they do not comply with their obligations to report material that they find. 
And so the incentives here are for platforms to over-report. Because if they don't report something that turns out actually to be photographic CSAM involving actual abuse of children, they don't just face legal liability and fines, they face bad PR, they get hauled up in front of Congress with their CEO to get yelled at by senators for not doing enough about child safety. Whereas on the flip side, the law generally immunizes platforms, both civilly and criminally, if they report an image that turns out not to meet the federal definition of CSAM. And so as it is, platforms report things that don't meet that definition. They report cartoons and anime. They report photos that uh, pediatricians have requested from parents to take of their children to send in. They report kids goofing around and taking <coughs> pictures of their butts and putting it up on YouTube. There's been a great series by uh, Kashmir Hill at the New York Times has published a few uh, stories about this over the last year or two. And so the, the incentives in this direction are report it all and let Nick Mick and ultimately law enforcement uh, sort that out rather than taking on the burden of deciding should we report this or not. It's safer just to report it all. And one side effect of that, and one side effect of the sheer amount of material that does get traded online that is photographic CSAM, is that the cyber tip line run by Nick Mick is under a lot of strain as it is. Um, they receive well over 30 million reports a year from platforms at this point in time. Um, most of those go internationally, only a small fraction stay here in the United States. Uh, but they are basically uh, the clearinghouse for the entire world in terms of getting this material in from, uh, from platforms and then figuring out which law enforcement agency to route it back out to again. And that's a lot of work for what is actually a relatively small uh, organization uh, that doesn't necessarily have uh, a whole ton of people at working at it the way, uh, on, on the scale of a Google or a Meta, for example. Um, and so the upshot there is, as CGC SAM becomes more prominent, as it leaks out from just being on dark web forums or private messaging groups into the open web, those platforms are going to report this as well. That's going to further burden the pipeline that has already been under strain for quite a while. And as platforms and uh, Nick Mick and law enforcement try and figure out what to do with it, is this a real image of a real child or is this AI generated? Who's being depicted? Can we figure out where this kid is um, or figure out that there's no kid that exists to rescue, that is going to divert resources that could be used in trying to intervene in actual cases where a child is in actual current danger and being actually abused. So all of this brings up the question of what is it that policymakers can do about this new uh, form of an existing age-old problem. And I think the top line is just that this is a really nuanced and really difficult issue that requires being treated with uh, the nuance that it deserves rather than a knee-jerk response that I have sometimes seen from policymakers of we're just going to ban it all and you know let, let it sort itself out. But that said, there is a little bit of low-hanging fruit in that it turns out that not every state, states mostly criminalize uh, CSAM under their own state laws, not just by reference to the federal law. Some states don't have a morphed image provision in their definition of what constitutes CSAM. And if they were to add that, I think that would address a lot of the real world cases that we're already seeing where teenage girls and their families are going to the police and saying, the kids at school are making these images of me and the police are telling them, there's nothing that we can do about this. Either because they are ignorant of federal law or because they don't want to refer somebody to the FBI about this or because they're just ignorant about what the law does or doesn't cover. But nevertheless, if we had clear protection under all 50 states and all the various territories, et cetera, for morphed imagery, that would get us a long way with regard to the real world effects that are happening right now to actual kids. Um, there's also a need, I think, perennially for greater resources for NCMEC and for law enforcement to handle the coming influx that they expect to see of CGC SAM that is going to start coming into the cyber tip line. As far as I know, the cyber tip line only got a few thousand reports where the platform indicated uh, in 2023 that it was AI generated material, but that number is going to continue to grow. And then I think there's also room in existing law to craft a very narrowly uh, tailored law that would prohibit the manufacturer or trafficking in ML models that have been trained up on actual abuse imagery. Um, you'd have to be really careful to do this in a way that wouldn't end up unintentionally prohibiting uh, general purpose technology. So as things stand under current CSAM law, we don't ban Photoshop, we don't ban digital cameras, we ban using those things for this particular type of, of material that is unprotected speech. You'd have to be careful in designing something prohibiting trading of models to make sure that you have 
uh, narrowly targeting what the technology is, having particular intent requirements, having knowledge requirements, because you also don't want a situation where you inadvertently criminalize people who downloaded an ML model not knowing or having any reason to know that it had been trained on actual abuse imagery, which again, not a hypothetical, something my colleague David Thiel actually did and published research about through SIO relatively recently, um, causing a pretty widespread freak out after he had found confirmed child abuse imagery in a widely used AI training data set. Um, nevertheless, this is something where trying to thread that needle is something Congress has done before, in that Congress has, for example, uh, passed a law prohibiting trafficking in devices whose only use or their main use is something that is already illegal. For example, wiretapping somebody else's communications. It is already illegal to traffic in tools for eavesdropping on other people. And so we have at least a little bit of a template for writing something similar uh, that we could use when it comes to ML models. And then finally, um, there is a need to include this particular problem in the national strategy for synthetic imagery. When the White House released their executive order on AI around Halloween last year, it's pretty comprehensive and long. It only mentioned CGC CSAM once or twice. Um, there are some sensitivities in this particular area that make research and uh, strategy different in that you are allowed to own as many copies as you want if you are a researcher of slowed down Nancy Pelosi or the deep fake pope wearing a puffer coat. You are not allowed to own as many copies as you want of actual child sex abuse imagery in order to try and do digital provenance, authentication, detection, all the things that we need to do in order to fight uh, the, the flood of AI generated material that is making it hard to know what is real and what is not. So even keeping those particular things in mind, it will require a more you know, careful and strategic approach to authorizing research in this area, getting vendors involved, uh, because owning the underlying material to try and tell real, train something to tell real from fake or determine provenance is itself potentially a crime. Um, but I think this is something that lawmakers are starting to become aware of and recognize the need to bring more hands on deck to help out. Um, and with that, I think we can transition into questions. Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much for a great talk on a difficult uh, subject. I thought for the, for the non-lawyers in the room, which is most people in the room, it might be useful just to start with the rationale in Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition as to why virtual child pornography is uh, protected speech, because I think most people are surprised to hear that. I know legislators, when I talk to them, are, are surprised to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few different things. One of them is... We start with the assumption that speech is allowed unless it is prohibited, right? I think it is easy, maybe from being used to being online on large platforms that just say our policy is that we don't want this, that, and the other category of speech, it's easy to forget that a lot of speech that a lot of people consider really gross or objectionable is protected speech. Um, and so in the Supreme Court case, you know, they were not rushing to defend uh, you know, virtual depictions of child abuse as being, you know, valuable to society, but nevertheless, the court said, you know, there is such a very narrow number of categories of unprotected speech that the Supreme Court has been very jealously guarding against expanding. And so where the underlying, uh, where there's underlying criminal conduct that you cannot separate that out from the speech in question, which is the imagery recording that underlying crime, the court said, we're trying to protect children here. The criminal element of this is indivisible, and therefore, that's why in the Ferber case, uh, 20 years before that, the court had said, yes, this is uh, something that we can prohibit. But all of that goes away when we're talking about virtual material. And the government had tried to make a few arguments about why there are still some indirect downstream harms that come from even virtual material, all of which the court struck down, including things like, well, what if this inspires people to commit a hands-on abuse crime? And the court had said, we don't ban speech just because it might tend to inspire somebody to commit a crime. We have really narrow categories for what is incitement or true threats, and if it might potentially inspire it, that, that, that doesn't cut it. So all the rationales that the government had made for why even virtual material has harms that justify uh, shutting that down as a category of speech uh, didn't pass muster with the court. As you mentioned uh, in your discussion of the case as well as in, in the talk generally, um, Obscenity is an area of unprotected expression, and so you can ban obscenity. But because of the 
you know, the, the, the three-part Miller test, which is very vague that anyone, you know, when I teach it to students, you sort of look at this and you wonder either why isn't all pornography that's online uh, obscene or is any of it obscene? And so um, how optimistic are you that most of the, whatever we agree is problematic, CSAM, that, that, that's virtual, would be captured under a appropriately drawn obscenity statute? I mean, it's a great question, and it's so hard to tell because one of the things that makes obscenity harder is that, like you said, it's sort of a know it when you see it, you know, uh, sort of rationale. And just so people know, that's literally right where where Justice Stewart uh, uh, uses that in uh, the earlier uh, right, cases. Right. Yeah. Um, but as you say, like the three part test is a little bit squishy. Whereas when we're talking about photographic CSAM, is there a kid in this picture? Yes. Is that kid under eighteen? Yes. This is illegal, right? It's it's much harder to say. Um, when it comes to the obscenity test. I think that there are going to be situations where um, you might have a wobbler, where prosecutors might think we might be able to persuade a jury, but maybe you can persuade a jury in Fresno and you can't persuade a jury in San Francisco. Um, and like I said, because this is such a squishy test, because it lets in jurors' personal biases, I am concerned about what sorts of cases prosecutors might decide to square up under obscenity doctrine or not. With that said, um, I think you know the Venn diagram is pretty high overlap. So if you have a picture that involves 10-year-olds instead of 17-year-olds, that's a virtual computer-generated image, I think prosecutors would have an easier time with that. I haven't done research on the actual forms where this material gets traded, although I think David has, to know like what is the actual market out there, what does it actually look like for what people are looking for. I don't know whether the bulk of what people are looking for is that little sliver that might not qualify as legally obscene or whether most of it is something that would easily you know, probably is yeah. well. I mean, the, the 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 pornography is so prevalent online. Right. The the difficult question it seems to me is if if so much of that pornography is not currently obscene among adults. Right. If you know, is the mere fact that it, it that y younger people are in the pictures and again, assuming we're talking about virtual CSAM, is that going to convert it into obscenity? I mean, if if obscenity. Uh, prosecutions were easy enough to bring, then there's a hell of a lot of the stuff that's on, on the web right now among adults that would not not be there. And so this is an end run to try to get at the, the kids problem, but it's, gonna, it's not clear definitionally how it is, well, once someone looks a little bit younger, that, that, that the same act that right. they're committing, that adults would be committing is somehow now constitutionally unprotected. Yeah, and, and my hope would be that the patently offensive prong of that test covers a lot of it, that there might be some level below which it is patently offensive in any community to have a depiction of, of, of children involved in sexual conduct. But this runs into all sorts of different, like, you're right, like, m weird American mores around sex where we have different ages of consent for the underlying conduct itself in various states, and yet we have this one federal standard that says anybody under 18, whatever the legality of engaging in it is, you can't depict it in a picture. Right, right. All right, so let, let's talk about the, the cases of actual children. So we have, we're getting lots of questions over online, and those of you uh, online should keep uh, sending them in. But I want to start with just this question of the, uh, like the non-consensual intimate imagery yeah. idea, right? So, so the high school kid takes a picture of, of someone in their class. They then put it on a, they run it through a model, or they just put it on a, a naked body or something like that doing stuff. Um, that that's a prob that, that that's not a, a kid's problem, right? Is it, it, it the victimization occurs from the from the lie, right? It's kind of more like right. or a right of publicity problem than it is actually an obscenity pornography problem, right? I think that's right, and I think you know the non-consensual pornographic deepfakes of people under eighteen is almost the easy case. Because it involves children, therefore something qualifies as being child pornography under the law. It gets harder once we're talking about adults, where um, you might not necessarily know if you have a particular image, is this revenge porn? Does this person want this image out there? Is this actually of them? Or did they consent to having it out there? Whereas you have this bright line of if this is somebody under 18, it is illegal for you to have that image or not. And so the adult question of non-consensual in intimate imagery gets so much more complicated, I think, than when we're talking about kids. And even when we're talking about people who are under 18, I think it is difficult because as I was saying, 
contra a lot of the coverage that I have seen of this topic, there is a law in the books that says it is illegal to do this, but it is a federal crime. And I think there's also policy questions that we have to have about if there are 15-year-old kids doing this to other 15-year-old kids, I don't think we also want it to be the national policy that we should refer 15-year-olds to the FBI to be prosecuted as federal child sex criminals and registered sex offenders for the rest of their lives either, right? So we have even there these complicating factors of what do we do about this as a phenomenon where the offenders, not just the victims, may be underage? Well, also, and I know this SIO uh, folks found, which is that there's consensual uh, child pornography, self-generated self material, right. material, which poses a whole other question about the, the nature of the injury. That? We don't want to send people to prison for their own material, I would think, either. Yeah, so there are all of these. Well, I don't, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But, 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 but j just the question is, you know, if it's a problem and we think that this is, yeah. we, we need to clamp down on it, um, do we want to, you know, th th there's there's the pornography, the obscenity, non-obscenity vector. There's the age, you know, below 18 or whatever, below 16, whatever it is, and 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 above, right? And so, we we can, for a lot of these issues, whether it's obscenity, whether it's non-consensual, even for adults, there's potential legal liability. Right. The question is, what more do we want to add on to it if it's if it's kids? And then are we, are we asking the, are we looking at the right uh, way of addressing this at all? Like what I've been talking about is just sort of what do the laws say, what does the Constitution say in terms of can we make this a crime? Whereas some of this I think is about social norms and about like making a norm for kids at school that doing this to each other is not okay, whether it's you're doing it to somebody who's 15 or somebody who's 30. And how we address that I don't think in like, like many you know, parts of child safety, we're not gonna arrest our way out of a larger social problem that implicates questions about misogyny and the sexualization of children and non-consensual treatment and cyberbullying just by saying, let's pass a new crime. All right, so we've got lots of questions. Oh, is this not working? Hello? Hello? Oh. Maybe not for the Zoom. Uh, so, all right, we've got lots of questions that are coming over the, the transom from online, but anyone in the room should raise their hand. Um, so go over there as I read Mark Lemley's question, which is about the harm from the training data right. on, um, on what might be child pornography. So he asks if the, if the training data set has never been viewed by a human, and if the output of a trained AI is neither obscene nor depicts an identifiable minor, how's the child harmed by the training? You see the question, which is, is that no question? one has actually seen the image, right. is his point. But 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 mere training, you're saying, is potentially uh, leads to liability. And he's asking, well... I think training on actual abuse imagery can yield liability. Simply because output. of possession. Because, yes, because there's still you're still using an image that involved the actual abuse of a yeah. child underlying it. That, Mark, I think is the answer, which is that as long as someone had right. possession on some hard drive somewhere, you know, of the image, then right. that, that automatically grants uh, But I think ability. there's a more interesting variant on that question, which is if I use an AI model locally to uh, generate an image that I never share with anybody, where there's no abuse imagery in the underlying training data, and maybe the output is a morphed image, or maybe it's somebody who doesn't exist at all. Is that illegal? And as the paper discusses, there is actually, at least when it comes to nothing involving um, real children, when we're just talking about obscenity, there is a private right to privately possess obscene material that stems not from the First Amendment, but from the Fourth Amendment. So I think there's an additional question of could we prohibit the training, you know, training an AI model to produce an image where there's no photographic imagery in the training data set? And the resulting image is something that somebody keeps to themselves and doesn't put online, doesn't share with anybody else. And there, I think, the law would have a hard time reaching that because of the right to privately possess obscene imagery. So as long as there's no real child in it. And even looking at court cases, there's been some question in the courts about if I make a morphed image but I never send it to the victim, the victim never sees it, it's not out there, there might not be as much of the harm rationale because if they don't know about it, 
it's harder for them to be harmed by it. They weren't involved in any actual hands-on abuse in the creation of it. And so there may still be some variance on this question where even after you get away from, does the training data include actual abuse imagery, which itself was a crime to make that imagery in the first place, there are some variants on it where I think it would be harder for the law to constitutionally potentially reach that kind of conduct. Let's go inside uh, the room, and then we'll go back to some of the online questions. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. I'm kind of curious, because I've seen a lot of online debate about whether CG, CSAM, that's photorealistic and not you know, morphed or derived from um, uh, training data of you know, photographic imagery, uh, about whether it reduces or increases demand for actual abuse to occur or for photographic CSAM to exist. If the evidence found that it reduces demand, is that an argument for refraining from prosecution under obscenity statutes or only prosecuting if you find that it did lead the person to actually you know, engage in taking photographic CSAM or uh, actual child abuse? Right, I mean, that's a, it's a great question and one where I know there's a lot of discussion over that question, but that, as far as I know, doesn't necessarily have a lot of evidence-backed studies to say one way or another in no small part, I think, because how do you ethically design a study for figuring out whether looking at fake material helps people not want to offend or not? There's a lot of areas where we just don't necessarily know and where people have very deeply, very personal opinions about what to do about that. But I think we don't necessarily know, like, in terms of actual empirical research, whether viewing you know, non-real material impedes hands-on contact offenses in the event that it reduces it, this is something that actually in the uh, in the Free Speech Coalition case, one of the rationales that the justices elucidated for why uh, they wanted to protect virtual material was that they said, well, we anticipate that if you've got the option to consume virtual material, well, you're gonna consume that because it's legal and you're not gonna go and consume the real thing. I don't think that prediction has aged particularly well. It's not as though the trade in actual material has vanished over the last 20 years because people could start using photoshopped imagery to gratify whatever their personal impulses were. So I'm skeptical of that as an argument, but I think it's one of those areas where we just don't have research one way or another to tell what it would do. I do think you know, the, the government, as I had mentioned, and Free Speech Coalition had said, it'll inspire people to commit more hands-on offenses. And that was something that the court already said, that's not persuasive enough. So even if the evidence came out the other way, the fact that even if it had it inspired a tendency to, wasn't persuasive to the court then, if it didn't inspire hands-on offenses, if it reduced that, I don't know that that makes a difference to saying this is already unprotected speech. I think everybody's sort of looking for a way of like, how do we recognize that there are people in society who have these impulses and how do we help them rather than throw them all in prison and um, what can we do for that? But it becomes really emotional really quick to talk about any of this, especially in an area where as said, it's gonna be really difficult to find like empirical data one way or another. So, so this is one of the areas where I think I've seen th there's a difference between the law, way law professors are talking about this and the way folks in the industry are talking about it. Um, the folks in the industry seem to be of the view that it whets the appetite, it doesn't sate the appetite, meaning that it will actually um, lead to either uh, actual attraction toward real CSAM or um, actual offline harm. Um, the, one of the there is an interesting study about pornography generally that Jonathan Click did, who's at um, I think still at Penn. He uh, he did he looked at where the internet first emerged in the United States, different states, uh, and tracked rates of sexual assault on the theory that the, that when there's pornography that you know is one of the first things that that is available through uh, the internet and he did find that it was there was a substitution effect he th he thought that it it, it decreased it. it's a controversial study i don't think it, everybody necessarily agrees with it but um, but i know that that was that was the best way to try to do this kind of difference and difference uh, analysis of it um, all right is any other uh, in the room let, right over here and then let me uh, go back to the online questions where we've got about a dozen hi rihanna thank you for your talk uh, you had said earlier something that made that resonated with me, which is the changing definition of obscenity. And I was thinking back to the 1980s when TV ads in the U.S. showed people putting deodorant on their hands or arms, where in England they were putting it on their underarms. And I was wondering about how the differences are between how the U.S. is handling the CGC SAM and how the uh, EU is handling it. 
That's a great question. I think, again, we're in a little bit of a unique position in terms of like, how do we combat this just because we have a First Amendment and everybody else doesn't. And so from what I can tell, probably the, the, the place that's been the most uh, vocal about this issue has been the UK equivalent of NICMEC, the Internet Watch Foundation. And I think they use a broader definition of what can be prohibited under their laws than we have here. We have the Free Speech Coalition case here that says some part of this is First Amendment protected speech. In other jurisdictions, and I haven't delved into other countries' laws so much, but because they don't necessarily have the robust free speech protections to the extent that we do, I think it is within their power to, to prohibit a, a much broader swath of material than we do. And so I'm open to being proved wrong on this, but I don't know if there's been freedom of expression challenges under you know, European rights. But I think it might almost be a little bit easier for them because they don't have to contend with First Amendment protections to the same degree that we do. So we have a question from Bruce Crawford online asking if anyone is tracking the system cards and model cards that the various AI providers uh, have modified uh, regarding their guardrails to handle these issues. Do you have a sense of what the industry, particularly AI industry, is doing to, to try to combat this? I wish Dave Wilner were in the room. He might be able to tell us. I don't think he's here today. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to it. I will say um, I know there are folks who are trying to keep tabs on what is happening with uh, models and tweaks being made to those. My colleague David Thiel might be working on something like this. I think there's work being done at Georgetown as well, but I don't know the answer to that but, one. But isn't it fair to say, though, that in the open source world that we will now forever live in a world of potentially infinite child pornography, I mean, of virtual child pornography, that that is, that the fact that you can now put this on your laptop and you can create this stuff, is like that, there is no way we are, we are going back, back to a box, time right. uh, where, where individuals don't have that power. I think that's right, and you know, this is why it has been disappointing to see so many after the fact mitigations being applied by model makers. I'm thinking here of, if I'm recalling correctly, when Stable Diffusion released an early model, they said, we trust our users. And they very rapidly found out that they could not trust their users. And so it has been, you know, even when we have the best actors trying to design something in a way that will prohibit it from being used, the adversary is cleverer than you are, and they will think up edge cases that you won't. The Taylor Swift deepfake nude came ultimately out of Microsoft. There's probably nobody you know, with more resources out there to try and think through this and with a long time experience of horrible users than, than that. And even they couldn't figure out a priori how to keep this from being used to, to victimize Taylor Swift. So I agree with you that we may just be living in this world now, but at the same time, there were ways to try and build a stronger door to keep the horse from fleeing the barn and those were not put in place with some of these model makers who are now having to contend after the fact with how do we fix the thing that we released out there before it was ready for prime time. So I'll say on, on the Zoom, someone has put up an article that, that tries to answer this question that says that people um, have, those who have used CSAM are more likely to actually uh, commit uh, crimes related to that. Um, last uh, question, and that is, um, what do you think the chances are that we're gonna change First Amendment law given the new technology? This was Justice Thomas in his separate opinion in, in um, in Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, presciently raises the idea if this destabilizes our ability to enforce uh, against actual CSAM, and what not even calling it that at the time, then maybe we need to rethink this. But but that wasn't you know that wasn't the issue at the time. Just so people understand, like what what happened in that case, in the they were almost thinking about virtual child pornography like paintings of of child pornography, right? And so uh, you know real fictitious stuff. Whereas now, now we, we're, we're looking right. at stuff that, that's indistinguishable. You think that, that the court might move away from its very libertarian view on, on virtual child pornography? There's a whole portion of the paper that's devoted to this exact question, which is that several of the justices had left open the door that if there were an age where there were starting, where, where the, well, it's not real, you, you can't prove it's not, that, that it's real, defense started to succeed. The, some of the justices on the court at the time said they would be open to revisiting it and saying maybe we would need to do what it currently considers to be overbroad and ban the virtual material alongside it. 
And what my paper says is this isn't a very comforting thought that the only person from that time who's still on the court is Justice Thomas, sitting in a much more hard right, you know, m you know, majority that might be potentially more open to that argument. They've already taken one of my constitutional rights away. I don't like the idea of narrowing another, you know, part of the Constitution. But what that argument rests on is basically saying, well, the prosecution is going to have to prove that an image is real beyond a reasonable doubt. And if they could not do that, and people start getting acquitted, doesn't that justify making less material protected by the First Amendment? And in my view, that's basically c curtailing the First Amendment because you don't like the outcome of Fifth Amendment protections for due process and a fair trial. If you start to view acquittals by criminal juries because the government has not carried the burden it always carries of proving beyond a reasonable doubt every element of a criminal offense, and you start seeing criminal jury acquittals as a systemic failure that has to be rectified by narrowing the boundaries of First Amendment protected speech, I think that's a problem as well. Please join me in thanking Rihanna Pfeffergordon. <laughs>